Good morning, everyone. This is Chaitali Bath from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. As the countdown to the 89th Indian Air Force Day begins, ADU has started its series on the role of industry in making Indian Air Force a force second to none. Keeping in mind its modernization and expansion to meet the geopolitical challenges of the nation. Today, we have with us Mr. Kishore Jairaman, President Rolls-Royce, India and South Asia in an exclusive interview with Aviation and Defense Universe in the run up to Air Force Day. Sir, it is privileged to have you on its show. And I now request our editor, Sangeeta Saxena, to steer the discussion ahead. Thank you, Jatali. Uh, a real pleasure to have you, Kishore. It's wonderful to have Mr. Jairaman with us for all our audience. Rolls-Royce has had a long history with the Indian Air Force and just an appropriate day when we sit together to discuss Rolls-Royce long association with the Indian Air Force. Welcome to the show, Kishore. And my first Thank question you. to you is that uh, just tell us about your relationship with the Indian Air Force. Okay. So we'll go back in history and a long way back, uh, Sangeeta. But before that, uh, first thing is thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with you all. And uh, it's a privilege that I'm able to represent Rolls-Royce here. I started this journey for my uh, The first thing that happened to us was start our mail back in 1932. And right behind that, we were able to serve the Indian Air Force in 1936. So we started our journey with the Air Force in 1936. And since then, we have uh, gone from milestone to milestone. And the most recent one was the Hawk trainers uh, that we sold to the Indian Air Force in about 2010. We were participating on the MMRCA and we were looking for opportunities in other programs that have come about since then. But the Jaguars have been there before that. We have a very healthy partnership with HAL where we do a lot of the MRO work for the Jaguars, their door engines. So 1936 with the Indian Air Force and immediately after the Indian Navy Aerospace and then followed by 1956 with HAL and then followed by uh, you know our uh, orders uh, in terms of the uh, Jaguars and then in terms of the uh, in terms of the Hawk trainers but along with that then came along the C-130Js and so our engines power the C-130Js and we were privileged to be on that platform and uh, so the history has been really really strong for us the relationship has been very very strong for us we serve the Air Force locally with our partner HAL and our, our relationship with HAL has also grown over time. So we become more and more entrenched in the ecosystem in India. We continue to look to serve the Air Force and the relevant forces in India with our products and services um, as we go forward more locally than globally. That's wonderful, actually. So it's a real long relationship. And uh, as we proceed, there is also your relationship which you mentioned with HAL very long. So exactly what, you know, for our audience, Kishore, we'd like them to know as to what exactly does Rolls-Royce do with HA? Well, Rolls-Royce has been married to HAL even before my parents married. You know, that's how long it has been, honestly. And um, right. I think, uh, you know, since 1956, we have had a very healthy partnership and marriage with HAL. That's what I'd call it because it's not been without our challenges. It's not been without, uh, you know, misunderstandings, but I think all through both partners stayed together. And, uh, you know, we have solved one challenge after the other, one problem after the other, and have been able to serve in India since 1956 with HAL till today. So first it was technology transfer, then it was service centers, then it was solving, ironing out challenges we had at the service centers. Then what happened was around 2010, we formed a joint venture with HAL and we call it as IAMPL. Originally, it was meant to be a defense joint venture, but eventually it converted itself into a civil aerospace joint venture. That's how we began this. And we make uh, compressor components, shrouds, cones, et cetera, there. These parts are made here Supply chain is here. Some supply chain is from overseas and they are manufactured here. It's not an assembly facility, it's a manufacturing facility. 
we manufacture it here and it ships out of IAMPOL and goes straight into our assembly facilities in Germany and UK and they get assembled into the units. And initially we were doing it for some legacy parts, right, like the V2500 engines. But then over a period of time, today, IAMPL makes parts for the XWB. Today, IAMPL makes parts for the BR725 engines. And today, IAMPL is looking at Trent 1000 parts. Beautiful thing about it is that we have got permission from the Indian government for our 50-50 joint venture to be able to do defense parts. And once we got that permission around 2017-18 timeframe, we are now making parts for HAL, right, for their door engines. And we are also going to make parts to our Indianapolis center in the US. So this joint venture is, a, is sort of a symbol of our relationship and the strength of our relationship. It is one of the top JVs for HAL and it is one of the top JVs for Rolls Royce. And uh, we want to grow more with HAL. So recently we signed a supply chain agreement with them for HAL to make parts for their door engines for us globally. Right. And that is a new thing that has happened. It is not there before. And with that coming on board, Sangeeta, I think, uh, you know, we are looking at even healthier partnership for a supply chain, but also enhancing the center of excellence capabilities for door engines here in India. So really proud of it, really privileged to be a partner with them. Good. This means that this is a make in India for a global market. That is correct. Yes. Yes. That's wonderful. And That's this is a classic awesome. example. It's all export. All, all everything I am makes for the civil aerospace is export. Everything I am makes for the defense side, it'll be exports and imports. So that's your make in India and make for the globe concept. Wonderful. That's really very nice to show. Uh, Kishore, yes. by so many years of association with Rolls Royce, there's been a very uh, there's been there been two phrases which you've always spoken about which is co-creation and co-development. And currently we have, you know, two major policies of Make in India and Atma Nirbhar Bharat. Now, how do we merge these uh, to yeah. this co-creation, co-development? How do we merge these? And uh, do we have, you know, when we talk about just having them with HAL, fine. But then have we yes. gone beyond HAL? Have we tapped yes. the uh, private industry in India? Or have we gone yes. through some other forces which have come together abroad and then, you know, have formed something in India? So I would just like yes. to understand that. Yes. Now, it's a very, very good and a very a question I can talk to you about for probably a day, but I'll try to do that very quickly here. <laughs> but, uh, and it's a topic and it's a topic very close to my heart, Sangeeta, because if you take the, you know, when you look at it in the past, in the defense side, there's been a lot of work that has happened wherein we have sold stuff and India has bought a lot of stuff. It is obvious that it's no secret that 70% of the things that happened in the defense side have been imported. But now the focus that came about in India, I believe it's around 2014 time frame, where the focus became very, very, um, you know, about make in India, but make in India, defense lended itself easily to make in India because of the security concerns and because of the need of the hour and the amount of ex ex imports that we had. So companies like Bharat Forge have really stepped up to the challenge. Startups have been looking for opportunities how to do it. And they have also built themselves. C295 with Airbus for Tata's is a, is a great example of how the whole make in India, which moved um, forward towards not only assembly, but manufacturing and also making an old aircraft in India concept. So it's a great step forward. What we are missing in this equation are the engines. Now, when you take the engines, the engines are still being bought out, right? And when Mr. Parikar was the defense minister, he brought this concept of IDDM, indigenously designed, developed, and manufactured. And uh, around the same time is when my mind was, you know, sort of very firm about this co-development and co-creation. Co-development is probably follows the co-creation concept because co-creation is purely about creating IP. And if India owns IP, then you are self-reliant because with the IP, the supply chain is created by us, the engineering has been done by us, the servicing will be done by us. So it creates a ecosystem around that will be owned by us, right? And to co-develop what it means is we don't have to reinvent the wheel to co-create. 
there can be joint IP concepts, right? And there are technologies around the world. Engines are being made around the world. But then we can create an engine to our specifications, but it can be done in partnership with countries, governments, private companies, right? And the private, and in this whole equation, with our framework, I think we have DRDO, which is an excellent organization doing a lot of good work. And so DRDO getting involved with the GTREs or the NALs in, in, their, in their scheme of things, and then combining it with the G2G program where a country like UK is able to allow companies like Rolls-Royce to share technologies or create technologies. Sharing is one thing. Sharing is a technology license agreement. But creating is a joint IP. And then if you do the joint IP concept, tomorrow we have the jobs that are safe and they are in India to take it forward, innovate from there, build on it, and then we become totally Atmanirbhar, right? So to me, it is, you know, the prime minister's vision previously about the make in India, it's a natural progression into the Atmanirbhar concept. But make in India is taking a technology and manufacturing in India. Atmanirbhar is about creating that technology in India. This is the way I look at it. This is the way Rolls-Royce looks at it. And I think, you know, I see a lot of, what should I say, a lot of enthusiasm in this particular concept. And that enthusiasm comes from the fact, and optimism comes from the fact. Look at vaccines. We developed a vaccine in India, right? Make in India concept was COVID shield, which we did very well, and we became an expert at it. Atmanirbhar concept is Covaxin. And I think, you know, that's the way I'd like to explain that. And we have shown absolutely. to the world we can do it. <laughs> that's a great analogy, you know, absolutely. I, uh, whatever we are talking about, have we translated it in ground and have we formed joint partnerships with Indian companies to take the process further? Well, the challenge has always been you know, if an individual company like Rolls-Royce were to do it, to, there's a lot of things that can prevent it from happening because a program on engine development or aircraft as a whole development is very expensive. Only governments can fund it. If you go to the Western world, you'd have seen this, that the governments fund these programs, US and UK, I know for sure. Germany, France, everybody does that. So in India, the funding has to be somehow brought together. Either it is in the form of a program within India that Indian government sponsors, or it can be a joint program where this development happens between two countries, for example, UK and India, and both countries have the IP. Both countries have funded the project. We not only do it for Atmanirbhar within India, but we also grow it for exports overseas. And for exports overseas, I think having this tie with a different government will be very useful because they also have other ties which will allow us to expand ourselves in a pyramid sort of a scheme, right? And that's what will help our exports a lot. And once exports grow, there is no restriction. We can probably manufacture this that is overseas. It's just like we are doing the C-295, the development of the C-295 happened overseas. There is an IP owned somewhere else, but they are manufacturing it. They're willing to manufacture it in India. Similarly, we can own the IP and we can manufacture it anywhere in the world. Right? So it's a reversing the whole trend that we have, that we have wanted to do, which is making India, reversing it so that we make it the globe, but we have designed it globally, but we have the IP owned by India. It was created in India. Yeah, and in continuation to this, I just wanted to understand, is there a supply chain you have improved upon in India, the Indian ecosystem, because Indian ecosystem is now in current situation, very much a part of you know the foreign OEM and the Indian supply chain. So uh, what has been the development of that front? So initially, you know, when I, in my previous job, I didn't have so much of complexities in terms of supply chain development, like in aerospace, because if you're developing supply chain for gas turbines for power generation, it's a mm -hmm. lot easier or wind turbines, it's a lot easier. Even then it was very hard because the capability curve was not understood in India and the capability curve was not exploited. Now, when I come into the aerospace segment, supply chain development is even harder because there is no room for error. 
And so the rigor that is placed on suppliers, so I know this because of our joint venture with HAL and the amount of, amount of challenges we had to overcome in order to satisfy people that we can make these things to the highest levels of quality repeatedly, right? So this, the development of the supply chain in India took us a long time. And today we have well over a half a billion pounds worth of orders in India over the next 10 years with key suppliers like Tata's, Bharat, um, you know, Godrej, and you know, a few others. There's only few for us. But the reason for the few is because it takes more than 18 months to 24 months in order for us to develop these suppliers, in order for us to be comfortable because we are bound by FAA and many other global bodies yeah. yes. in terms of what we need to yes. do to do to build our aircraft. So I think, do we have the capability in India? Absolutely, yes. Do we have the capacity in India? Absolutely, yes. Do we have the skills in India? We have enough skills that can be fine-tuned. Right? Every industry, everybody, when they talk about skills, actually there is a certain basic skill set required. But then every company has to tune that to their own requirements, which we also have to do, which we have done very successfully with IR. Right? And I think it is not an impossible task. I think it's a very doable task. And I think we are, if I go back eight years, I'd say supply chain build out is very hard. If I do it today, supply chain build out is very easy. But because of the COVID times and because of the state of the economies around the globe, we are a little bit trying to figure out what's the next step in this process, right? And leveraging what we've already done, but trying to figure out what's the next step in this process. Absolutely. And uh, does it mean that your uh, Rolls Royce also has the MSMEs on its radar in India? Um, so, so there are companies which, when Tata's is a tier one company, so, you yes. know, you have your interactions with the LNTs and Tatas right. of the world, but Godridge yes. for that matter. But then there are, a, there's a huge, you know, bandwidth of MSMEs, which are smaller yeah. companies, which yeah. are ancillary yeah. productions, you know, yeah. and yeah, they yeah. can right. make some parts and some things. So, you know, what about the uh, Rolls Royce uh, zeroing out on such MSMEs in India? And then, you know. Right. Yeah, with the MSMEs. Uh, Look, I mean, as far as the MSMEs go, there's a lot of ambition, right? And there are great companies who have come out, look, LMW and uh, Rooch. Um, there are many companies that we are looking at and saying, what can we do more? The issue with, the, with somebody who's coming into aerospace, in the first place is, how do they prove that they will be able to sustain it? Right, Acus, Acus for example, Arvind yeah, is a yeah. good friend and... Yeah. He's done a good job of trying to build the whole supply chain for aerospace. And it's, you know, it's not a cost play. Cost plays because it's very competitive. But it is more of the, quant the quality of the goods produced and the repeatability of the goods produced and the sustainability of the organization. So a company like LMW or Roots, there's no question on the sustainability. But the question becomes one of, can they do repeatability? Can they, will they go put in the investment required for the fair process, the first article inspection report to be created so they get qualified for it. So those are the things like a lot of people struggle with. India has been a very strong automotive supply chain. And a lot of people who are delivering to the automotive industry want to deliver to the aerospace industry. The jump is not so easy, right? The jump is very hard. In automotive, it's a pure question of, I don't want more and more quality, def uh, quality defects that will allow me to, you know, customers to claim warranties. And because the scale is so high, they have to be careful. But here, the scale is not so large, but a defect can bring down an aircraft, which is multi-million dollars, right? So it's not, it's not good for that. And so the, the rigor that is needed, the, the precision that is required, there was a period of time where I saw a lot of misunderstandings in that regard. But now I think companies get it. They put their own aerospace and defense on. They're all pushing this supply chain and they all become want to become tier ones. But the journey to tier one always starts off at the tier two, right? And then the tier two to tier one is a lot easier. And I think we should, we should really help MSMEs become tier twos because then they prove themselves in that space and then they can get into tier one. Like you rightly said, Tata is Godrich. They are already in there, right? Godrich does a lot of stuff for his store. They're into space stuff. 
right? Yeah, and absolutely. they do a lot on missiles. They do a lot on missiles. So they're already there in this in the space. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then you look at right. So that's my usually what I try to say to MSMEs. Look, Rolls Royce is not, you know, they're not saying we won't do it with anybody. It is just a question of we need to have the confidence and the comfort that they'll be able to do it. And to get that's a very high bar, right? And so that's where things get a little complicated. But it's not like we're not been working in Domem, we talked to we talked to LMW, we talked to Rouge, uh, we have talked to many other any others who are who started off as MSMEs who are doing very well, who are actually getting even bigger, and I think uh, you know watch the space. I think it'll keep growing. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, when we were yes. finishing your last uh, answer, you mentioned skill. Now, uh, what is Rolls Royce role in developing skill in India? And you also have a very good plan for women, you know, skilling women. I mean, we'd like our audience yes. to know about uh, this part of your yes. business, you know. Yes. Sure. I, I, you know, I'm very privileged that I had people under me who were thinking about this a lot more than I did. But, you know, some of these ideas when they were generated, I just could not stay away from them personally. And uh, the first thing was Rolls Royce said our focus is only on STEM. And we wanted to do STEM. So science, technology, engineering, and math, yeah. which is great. Absolutely. So we said, how do we do? And it started off as being a CSR thing. And we said, okay, CSR, let's start only STEM. And as we were doing STEM, we thought about it. And we said, look, the thing in STEM is that there's not many women participants in STEM. And as, as women grow and as the girls grow and become women, they're usually switching streams and going into more finance, HR, IT but still don't stay with the core engineering. So we said, how do we develop them? So all these developed into CSR projects for STEM, then they developed into women and uh, diversity, and we have been able to create programs. The Unnati program has been created. We're able to create, you know, support women so that they can study in that area, but not only just study, but be able to get jobs in that area, right? And internally within our joint ventures, we promote to look at these women who are graduating from these programs and then see how we can absorb them into our workforce. And so it has been a question of how do we make sure not only people inside Rolls-Royce understand that, it's very easy for us to get engineering graduates in electronics, but it's very hard to get engineering graduates in mechanical engineering. But some of the manufacturing facilities need more mechanical engineers than electronics engineers. But we still have a split of those that we wanted to create and so that SEMS initiative that we had yeah, in yeah. principle uh, taught women about uh, the Siemens software, yeah. right? And this is, a, this is a manufacturing tool that is used. And uh, so by training themselves in that area, women can fit more easily into the manufacturing environment and they can do exactly like anybody else does. But they did not have the wherewithal to do it in some cases, which is where the scholarship comes and they do not have the interest to do it, which is where the STEM comes from, and a little bit of push from Rolls-Royce. Um, I think we are seeing a lot of uh, green shoots in that area, uh, definitely a long way to go, but we yeah. have been able to reach out to a lot of people, and I'm very, very proud about that, the initiatives that we have there. And um, in terms of uh, skilling, you know, for me, what is interesting is that we always want to say that, okay, I want aerospace and defense, we want to skill everybody. The question is, where are the jobs, right? Simple example I'd like to give the world today in India is that um, when you look at data analytics, five years back, none of the universities talked about data analytics. None of the universities talks about programs in data analytics. Yeah, yeah. But then today, everybody, when they're going to the US to do a master's, they want to do data analytics. They want to go to UK to do undergraduate, they want to do data analytics. It has become the way of future education, just like at one time IT was the future of education. And if you go back to my times, it was either engineers or doctors. Nobody else wanted to touch it, oh, right? And then after that, what was it? Chartered accountancy, corporate secretaryship, company secretaryship, all these things picked up. Why did they pick up? And this is a question we don't ask. Why they picked up is because the jobs were in that area. And, right, and today we say, oh, we want a skill in aerospace and health. I agree with that. But what jobs are out there? If anybody who graduates from an aerospace and defense program lands into a job, you don't have to sell that. You don't have to build the skill. All you have to build are universities that give you that skill 
and students will flock there. But today it is a challenge to even get students in there. So we don't have enough skills developed because students are not too keen on it. But then students who take it up, they need to find a path towards a job. Do we have that many jobs? What is the, the first analysis which I've not seen and I'd like to see is, what is the demand, demand supply curve there? And if you see the demand supply curve, if it is skewed more towards us pushing students to do our skill in that area, not landing in a good job, we are wrong. If you see the demand is so much, they're not able to hire, then that is also wrong. And that curve is easier to correct than the first curve. The third most important thing is, I think every organization understands, every company understands, you're not going to get somebody tailor-made for something. Just because somebody graduates from a university and says, I got a supply chain degree, he's now the master of supply chain, right? Supply chain is a thing about engineering to analyze the, you know, know your technology, know what you want from the supplier in that technology and how you're going to build your ecosystem around it. It's a very complex area, but every organization deals with that complexity very differently. Some have a very strong digital thing. Some have a very strong analog thing. And Rolls-Royce was very analog and now we are going very digital. But then I can get somebody from IT and say, now go do supply chain for me because he will understand digital piece of thing, but won't understand the supply chain piece of things. Then I go and find a supply chain guy and say, come and work in this area. He won't understand the digital tools that we have. So you will have to go train them on the job. So the next alternative to that, so the best way is either you go higher with understanding you train somebody for a year or so. And then they get into the job and you're building them in the company. But then the worry is what happens if they move along, right? If there are common tools, people move along. If there are bespoke tools, they stay with the company. Those are all different challenges to address. But bottom line is organizations understand and we have to understand nobody is perfect. Yes, absolutely. Right? Right. And that the other option we have to do, which is I think universities are doing this a lot, is basically providing with apprenticeships. Rolls-Royce has a graduate program where people join when they are right out of high school. They educate themselves through Rolls-Royce in the engineering or specific field that they want to get into. We pay for their education and we even pay for their education for a master's degree while they are working with us. They are developing the practical skills and they are also developing the theoretical skills. And when this happens at the end of the day, when we see four years down the road, we have a perfectly trained, perfectly educated, employee. We need to do more like such concepts. And it's not just aerospace and defense. We're talking about A and D today, fine. But I think every sector, it has to be that way. And it the analysis should be very clearly on the demand supply gap. Right. Right? There can be no excuse where the supply is more than the demand. Hmm. Very, very true. Absolutely fine. And when we talk of skill, then we, it's a gradual, very natural uh, thing to move towards research and development. And uh, Rolls-Royce has been very active in R&D. So uh, we, we'd like to know about what R&D in India. So for us, we spend uh, more than a billion pounds annually on research and development. These go towards um, our past products, making sure they are relevant still and they continue to perform to our promises to the customer. The second piece is we need to address the present challenges with our existing products. Right? And the third piece is about the future and our future products. Right? So in all these three areas, we have collaborations with the universities. We have collaborations with the catapult centers in the UK, US, Singapore. And we are constantly looking to see how we can leverage academia, industry and government to build on this. And I think every company in every particular field has to strive to do it more so in the aerospace and defense fields, or more so in the aerospace field and defense of course, right? So for us, university partnerships, for us, catapult center partnerships are absolutely there. And when it comes to R&D, we see that a lot of programs that are government created programs. Germany created a half a billion dollar fund for this kind of initiative. UK constantly spends a lot of money. US, we know everything about DARPA and many other you know, relevant organizations that, that fund these programs. That's the only way companies like ours can actually put more and more resources into R&D. Right? Because 
yes, we can allocate a certain portion of our profits to R&D, but sometimes, you know, when you have COVID kind of times, there's no profit, then what do you do with the R&D? Because we won't be able to sustain it. Yeah. So we have to, and we don't want to let go. For us, positioning for the future is everything, right? And if you look at it today, we have invested on the total electrification, electric aircraft. You heard about the Axel program. Yes, yes. Right, the oh, aircraft yes, yes. took off. It happened during COVID times. It happened on time and it took off. Yes. And I think it's going to set a speed record very, very soon. And I think it's going to set a distance record very soon. And then I think we are going, we are going really bullishly on these things. And these things don't happen without partnerships. This program would not have happened without very bright young minds from the universities partnering with us. Right? Now, when it comes to India, we had our engineering teams here. And the engineering teams always look to partner with universities here. Because it is in our DNA as a global company doing it. So we tried to do a lot of that in India. Unfortunately, over the last year and a half, all of that has stopped because of COVID and you know, our own uh, struggle for, struggle for uh, making sure we make both ends meet. But it will come back again. But that's the way it has to be. Sangeeta, it's Absolutely. not going to happen when everybody operates in silos. I think we have to leverage, uh, you know, just exactly. like crowdsourcing, we have to do the uh, crowd pooling of uh, knowledge. And yes. that is not too far yes. in the future. Absolutely you correct. Know? You know, I think that is one thing which, and the Rolls Royce has had a history of doing all that, you know, to get uh, research has always been very important when it comes to doing those. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to ask you, uh, what what is the status of the delivery center in Bangalore? Absolutely uh, up and about and going steady. Uh, which one is this? The engineering. The, the delivery. The delivery center. Yes. Delivery center. Yeah. Ah. So the delivery center has been working. We have told people they can uh, work from home, work from the office. That's up to them. But actually, mm -hmm. the delivery center not only does it for the for the for India, they are also working for the entire Asia Pacific. Ah. And so okay. we continue to you know make sure that we provide the responses very quickly without any time zone differences. But there are some of the challenges that come to us are very complicated. So it doesn't happen very quickly. But the beauty is that we are able to talk to our customers face to face locally and able to take their questions and, and help our organization globally understand it and then provide the appropriate answers as quickly as we can. And it's going very well for us. And we want to do more. We will do more from a digital side of things there. And, um, and uh, as we go forward, I'll be able to share more of all the, all the successes we have had there, right? But right now, because again, once again, COVID set us back in a lot of areas, right? The last one and a half years has really slowed down things a lot, but needless to say, we have not let go of anything and we've been able to keep everything and we've been able to drive to position ourselves in the future. And uh, one other program, which another thing which I wanted to ask you about here was the Mission Care program for the C 150 Is it still operative? I believe it's moving along. It is moving along. It has been a concept change for quite some time. So, so getting the concept sold to a lot of people in both the Air Force side as well as the many other uh, uh, departments inside MOD, etc., has been uh, it's taken us some time. But I believe we are very close to it, and we should probably already have or we should get into that uh, sooner than later. I don't have any latest update on that right now, but I think uh, it is moving well because nobody can say no to something like that. It provides a lot of stability. It provides a lot of, uh, you know, what do you call uh, availability? And I think, uh, you know, I wish that it will happen uh, sooner if it's not already happened. Uh, another important thing which I wanted to ask you was for the net zero 2050. Now, is India a part of your plans for the net zero? Is there a supply chain which will be different from the current supply chain? And uh, can we, uh, you know, grow something for a global market within India? It's a very big program for Rolls Royce. Yes. So initially, our net zero program, as far as Rolls Royce goes, will apply towards our facilities. That's the mm -hmm. first place we can make a difference. So within our facilities, we are driving it forward. So for sure, we will drive it forward with our IM full facilities here in India. Mm -hmm. Right, that's a given. Now, the next step is for us to have net zero by 2050. And in our products and services will all be net zero. Right, that's a bigger challenge than uh, anything else. For us, we have to go all electric. We have to we have to look at many many different things, and we will continue to do that. The third piece for that is our supply chain. 
So with our suppliers, we'll definitely promote it, we'll definitely help them, we'll definitely support them. But, you know, we like to see how to drive that forward. I think it's an initiative for all of us. It's not like we have to drive our suppliers. They already know it. And they're probably going to be ahead of us in some ways. And we'll look forward to that. Right. And wherever we can support with the knowledge, where we can support with what we have done and what worked for us, we definitely will do that. Right. And I think we, as we go forward, you'll hear a lot more about it. The good thing is that India and the UK, I believe in the Prime Minister's dialogue, uh, they would included the sustainability initiatives that both countries will look together. And we are looking forward to participating in that and so figuring out how between UK and India and Rolls-Royce can be a knowledge partner to help that program be driven forward. So we are definitely looking forward to that. Right. That'll be wonderful. And, uh, you know, in addition to, uh, I'll take off from here, that uh, once we get a little nearer, I mean, it's, it's a very hypothetical question, to show. Yes. but I just wanted to understand that once we get a little nearer to net zero, which will, will it mean upgradation of the engines completely or will it mean changing the engine and getting the new engine? So uh, the existing ones could be new, relatively new at that spot in time. So, I mean, how does the Rolls Royce plan to do it? Right now, we are still in the drawing board on a lot of things, right? But one thing is for sure, the drive towards net zero has happened through the electrification program and the digital program, right? By combining our digital initiatives with our electrification initiatives, we are able to, first of all, get an aircraft that will fly all electric, right? Now, the next question is hybrid. When you go to the hybrid, the first immediate step that we have done. So we have done this for the next 10, 15 years window, but then you look at the immediate future, we're working on sustainable fuels. So when you have these sustainable fuel initiatives, it reduces the emissions. And then as the emissions start coming down, the question is, how do you bring it down more and more? It's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to be a slow phase out. So when the engines are operating more and more and more on sustainable fuels, you have less and less and less of emissions. It's not net zero, but the direction is correct. And then when you go into the full net zero point, hopefully, I don't think these are going to happen within any 20 year window. The life cycle of most of our products are 25 to 30 years, right? And they keep going, right? They keep going, which is good. But at that point, we'll have to figure out as we go forward, how long these products go for. And our support for the products we have sold is always there. And we're not going to leave our customers, you know, wanting at any point of time. So we'll definitely have to put a plan together between now and 2015. And that plan is in the works. And I think it'll keep changing and it'll evolve through it. But I think the you have started on the journey. And to be yes. honest with you, it's the beginning of the journey. A, long, a little long ways to go. All right, absolutely. For my next, next and my last question to you for today is that uh, we have come out of COVID and hopefully, hopefully, and uh, we definitely uh, would like to understand that now that, you know, everything is by and by getting back to normal. And we had a live show at DSTI and, uh, you know, Rolls-Royce is also back. So what is what are your plans now for, uh, suppose there was a loss in the last one and a half years, which uh, where, you know, you could not actually do things. What are the plans for the Indian Air Force? Because we are talking about the Indian Air Force on the Air Force Day. So we'd like to understand yes. from you that have we left something somewhere and where, where are we beginning again from? Well, interestingly, COVID times or not, I don't think we have uh, stopped any of the works uh, with Indian Air Force. Right? I mean, and we have continued a lot of the meetings because it is these initial stages, we could not have these meetings virtually. And so there was a little bit of a pause where the meetings happened over, you know, what do you call uh, um, telecom, right? I mean, telephones. But, um, you know, the work from our employees has continued through all this time, right? And I think they have been serving the Air Force day in and day out. And for us, really, the shutdown and the IAMPU joint venture was only for a month, believe it or not. And Karnataka government was very kind in saying that we give exceptions to the aerospace and defense industry. And because of that, we got that exception and we started our factories and we were able to deliver on time. In fact, our joint venture delivered on time to the global production facilities all through COVID times. And we were able to manage it without actually losing any employees. Definitely a lot of people did get COVID, but that has nothing to do with our facility or anything. But they all, it is all what happened to India overall. But as far as the Air Force goes, 
you know, as far as the Air Force goes, as far as the CHL goes, we have had uh, complete support through the entire time. As we go forward, I really wish that we will continue to engage with the Air Force and HAL and do more in terms of the co-creation projects. Do more in terms of uh, thrust recovery programs and maintenance of the existing fleet programs. Do more in terms of coming up with new ideas of positioning us in India with HAL, with the Air Force, with very, very close private partners of ours to achieve the sustainability targets. So that is what we're going to be focused on. That's what we're going to be working on. And I don't, uh, end of COVID is almost there because we have vaccinated 90 crore people. And uh, I am very proud, very proud to hear this. And I'm very proud to say we cross 100 crore mark. And I was just doing the math. Yesterday, they did one crore vaccinations. If only everybody would go out there and get vaccinated in 35 days, every single Indian will have their first dose. And within three, four months after that, all the second doses can be completed. We should be safe from uh, mortality with COVID. And that should help us, you know, business should pick up and business should uh, really, you know, go, go faster. Sure, that was wonderful. We had, you know, virtually all of our queries solved so nicely. Rolls Royce in India is a story and a very successful story. And Rolls Royce and its association with the Indian Air Force, absolutely wonderful, long. And we hope and pray that they continue like this till the next 100 plus whatever years we all exist. And uh, with that, you know, we put an end to this show, hoping to see you again nearer the Navy Day when we have a new topic a new set of engines, a new set of partnerships to discuss with you and the Rolls-Royce. Thank you very much for being on our show. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sakita. Really appreciate the opportunity. And congratulations to the Air Force on the Air Force team. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.